thanks for joining us. Um, so we're here this morning to talk about the zero emission bus transition plan in Canberra, Australia. My name is Ellie Short. I'm a senior principal transport planner in the planning and mobility team in Sydney, and I'm project manager for the project. Hi there, I'm Brian Smith. I'm a uh, technical executive with um, WSP in Sydney, uh, and I've been uh, I'm a public transport planner. I've been working on zero emission buses since about 2018. Hi everyone, my name is Lorraine Dejeune. I'm also in the Sydney team planning and mobility, public transport planner as well, working with Brian for the past two, three years, and also coordinating WSP's national capability, about ZEB, and coordinating with our colleagues in the US, Canada, and New Zealand. So just a couple of housekeeping points first. There are um, three PDFs in the handout box as a copy of the presentation today. Our zero emission bus white paper and flyer. And if you have any questions during the presentation, you're welcome to type them into the chat box. So we'll get started now. Just go off. Um, so the presentation today is about the zero emission bus transition plan that we've been working on for Transport Camera in the Australian Capital Territory, the ACT. So I'll talk about an overview of the project and background on zero emission buses in the ACT. And then Brian will explain about some of the technical dimensions around the modelling, depots and energy in particular. So next slide. Um, so Canberra is the capital of Australia over on the East Coast. It has a, and it's in the ACT, Australian Capital Territory. It's not our biggest city, um, it has about 430,000 people and today they operate around 450 buses with the fleet expected to grow to around 650 by 2040. There's currently two depots in Canberra which are operating at capacity. There's a third depot in the design stage called Woden which we'll talk about later and there's also a fourth depot in the planning stage. Next slide. So emission reduction targets are in place at a state level in Australia, which are really driving the bus transition plans. And this is a rapidly progressing area and reflects momentum being gathered in this space globally. So the ACT is converting their whole fleet to zero emission by 2040. And there's similar commitments and targets in other states and across Australia, which you can see on the slide. So this presents both an opportunity to coordinate and but could also cause some issues around procurement and supply chain. We have a small but growing local manufacturing capability for, for buses um, with a primary focus on battery electric buses at this point rather than hydrogen fuel cells. Next slide please. Um, so the ACT is 100% renewable energy powered and that's both through local solar generation and also a reverse auction process. So it means the zero emission buses that we're um, looking at are both zero emission at the tailpipe and also they use green energy to generate the electricity to power them too. The ACT has a target for net zero emissions by 2045 and transport accounts for around 60% of government emissions in the ACT with buses around half of that. So the transition to a zero emission bus fleet will really have an important impact on the overall emission reduction target. The ACT government have a specific action plan for the transition to zero emission vehicles, including cars and other private vehicles. They trialled two battery electric and a diesel hybrid bus back in 2018, and recently completed another year long battery electric bus trial. In September um, last year, they published a zero emission transition plan for transport, which was informed by our project. And now they're doing a market sounding process and looking at procuring a first tranche of around 90 battery electric buses for delivery by 2024. So an overview of our project here, um, the client was Transport Canberra, value over two stages around 750,000 Australian dollars. And the objective really was to support Transport Canberra in the transition and um, growth of their bus fleet to around 650 zero emission buses by 2040. We started um, around a year ago in April and the project's ongoing for another few months. The approach really was based on having a strong multidisciplinary team combining both local expertise and international resources and a, a high focus on flexibility and collaboration in this rapidly developing area. Next slide. Thanks. Um, 
So this shows the scope of stage one, um, which was really very comprehensive. And as I mentioned, the ACT had already completed trials. So really the focus was on how to integrate zero emission buses into the fleet. And the same is true for other trials and rollouts in Australia now. It's not about proving the technology because we know that it works. It's more about exploring operational issues and identifying locally specific points about how to make the, the buses work. So we started by looking at a baseline for bus operations now and a technology analysis globally. And then we looked at a mix of different options and assessed these. And some of the options included things like whether to have battery electric only or a mixed fleet with hydrogen using depot only charging or en route charging also. And then different speeds of transition linked to increases in depot capacity. So we worked with the client to agree um, a preferred option and then prepared an actual transition plan document um, for this. So that included costing and economic assessment and also a detailed implementation plan with specific actions. The next slide shows the project in the context of the overall transition. So we've got stage one here that we've already completed and then just clicking again, we'll see stage two that we're in now is really the detailed planning stage. And this is to support the procurement process for that first tranche of 90 buses by 2024. So we have four, four technical work streams, excuse me. <coughs> um, the first is network modeling to inform the bus operational strategy and charging needs. And that's using our Bolt tool, which Brian will talk about later. The second work stream is a depot design review. So that's to support the electrification of the new Woden depot, which will operate a partially battery electric bus fleet from day one when it opens. Thirdly, we've got the electricity network planning. So we're preparing an overall energy strategy, including looking at resilience and also a specific energy plan for the new Woden depot. And finally, we're developing a set of fleet and charger specification principles. So they'll be used initially to inform the market sounding process, which is currently underway, and then developed up in more detail later for the full scale procurement. And stage two will really then inform the implementation and monitoring and transition to, to zero emission. So I mentioned the project was highly collaborative um, at, and that was really at two levels, both internationally and in terms of the technical disciplines. So WSP has delivered over 90 zero emission bus projects now internationally, and we're really global leaders in this field. We've got a strong track record now as also with local zero emission bus projects here in Australasia and great skills in our local team. So we can effectively bring this global knowledge by including experienced international team members in our local services. And really everyone's quite an early adopter in this area. So we're all, all learning together and from each other, which is great. The next slide here talks about the a little to the technical collaboration. So technically zero emission bus projects are way more than transport projects. There's many interconnected elements. And it's also really important to combine sort of strategic advisory level thinking with technical depth. So the areas shown here are the main ones relevant to our project in Canberra. There's many more aspects than this too. Since stage one, we had quite a focus on the strategic planning. So we're looking at the different scenarios and analyzing the options, and then a high level service planning, looking at which routes could be electrified and when, a cost assessment of those, and also consideration of the workforce and industry impacts as part of the transition. So the impact on, on the people and the staff um, who operate the buses now and, and retraining considerations. Stage two is involved more detailed planning and in a, particularly an increased focus around the infrastructure needed. So in terms of facilities, I mentioned we're advising on the design considerations for the new depot. And then in terms of planning, we're getting into more depth in terms of the energy supply needs, um, discussions with energy provider, and also the operational strategy in the buses in a lot more detail um, informed by our bolt modeling. We're also picking up more now on the fleet and charger side, setting out those, those principles for the market sounding that I mentioned. The next slide um, explains how the international and technical collaboration really came together. So within Australia, we use multiple teams across WSP or working together. So um, Brian, Lauren and myself from Planning and Mobility, but we worked really closely with our advisory colleagues on the economics and energy side and also our power business as well. And we've really drawn on the power of WSP internationally and our track record on zero emission bus projects to bring, bring learnings from the globe. So 
We've got particular strengths in the USA, Canada and New Zealand, and you can see the services there listed that each group is providing for the project. So we bought specific experts for what was needed on this project, and we worked together internally, but also bought, bought them into client meetings and workshops as needed. In practical terms, we had some intercompany um, sort of agreements set up so we can work together and continue to do so easily on other zero emission bus projects. And we used a lot of tools like Microsoft Teams to collaborate and work together virtually, which has obviously become a lot more common over the past year anyway. So I'll hand over to Brian now, who'll talk more about the different technical dimensions of the project. Thanks, Ellie. Um, as Ellie mentioned, um, this is a, a quite a new and uh, rapidly evolving field. We've only actually got a few years of experience with um, battery electric buses, so we need to actually simulate um, operations to understand not just how well they'll operate on day one, but potentially years down the track. Um, so our BOLT tool that, that uh, Ellie mentioned, it stands for Battery Optimization and Lifecycle Tool. It's developed by um, WSP Canada. We use it on this project. It can identify uh, the power needs of um, existing or, or future battery electric bus services. Uh, and also it can uh, identify the compatibility of existing schedules with uh, zero emission bus operation, in this case, battery electric buses, given their range limitations. So it's not a tool that, that's just using a bunch of American or European data. It uses local data and it considers a bunch of factors that you can see here. And some of the key ones are sort of the, the temperature, um, how steep the route is, the scheduled speed of bus routes, uh, the number and spacing of bus stops, uh, which, which affects things like regenerative braking, um, the passenger loading, uh, and also the length of the routes that buses are assigned to. And Canberra's got some interesting differences to some many other Australian cities. Uh, it has some longer and some higher speed routes than many other Australian cities, and it requires a, a generally a greater daily range from some of their existing services in the order of 350 kilometres per day. It's also got quite a wide temperature range uh, compared with most Australian cities, uh, not as extreme as some European and North American cities, but for example, we uh, we have winter temperatures in Canberra that range from say minus five Celsius to um, summer temperatures that uh, can exceed 45 degrees Celsius. So this is an important factor in how well um, zero emission buses will, will function. You can see on the top right of this slide is a little sort of diagram that kind of gives an example from another city of um, that kind of uh, what are the contributions to energy draw um, on an electric bus? And you can see this one, for example, shows that you know 40% of the energy draw is related to distance in this case, but uh, air conditioning and, and ventilation can be pretty substantial. You see here it's, it's 20% uh, elevation and steepness and then stop. So we can identify the contribution of these and, and help um, our client to uh, um, reschedule and reorganize their services to make sure that they're compatible. Next, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Laura. So um, one of the key things that, that uh, Elliot mentioned is depots. We talk a lot about depots in this presentation and this was a, a pretty key consideration for Canberra. They only have two depots there and they're pretty much at capacity. And we determined quite quickly that any attempt to convert these depots into battery electric bus operation while they're live ran some pretty substantial service delivery risks. And so um, the strategy for Canberra is very influenced by the need to plan for and deliver additional zero emission bus depot space. Uh, and, and zero emission bus depot design is quite different um, than conventional bus depot design. And you, that, Potentially, your battery electric buses need quite a bit more space for charging equipment that can affect capacity. And so we were able to draw on particularly our North American experts where uh, they brought experiences from cities that have already begun to sort of build and, and uh, operate bus depots to help inform the work in Canberra, to demonstrate this is what battery electric buses look like. And you can see some of the key considerations on this slide. So one of the ones that many people don't think about is that in addition to maintaining a fleet of new buses, you probably have to maintain and service a fleet of chargers. You may have almost as many chargers 
as buses. So this is a, a new consideration for depot operations. Other interesting things relate to, um, to maintenance. You can see on the top right, much of the maintenance here on a battery electric bus can be done by a person with a laptop uh, in the depot yard rather than having to put the bus into a maintenance bay. Uh, and other key things are around uh, the, the way that ch recharging is, um, is carried out, whether it's at the ground level, uh, uh, manually plugging in and unplugging, or increasingly the use of pantograph uh, chargers, which um, allows for overhead charging, which, which can be uh, much more automated and much more efficient. Next, please. So the power needs of a battery electric bus depot can be pretty substantial. So uh, the, the, the requirement for electricity for a bus depot might change from the equivalent of a small factory to basically an entire suburb. And getting power into the depot, either overhead or, or underground, um, and planning for things like transformers and switch gear and then the infrastructure that's actually required by the energy provider, all this needs to be considered and integrated. And this is where our global tools like Bolt, you can see a graph at the bottom there. This is a Bolt output, which identifies peak energy needs under a, a particular charging scenario for a depot. Uh, how this knowledge integrates with our local understanding of the electricity grid and the distribution companies to make sure we can optimize planning and design, and particularly lead times for the delivery of the infrastructure that needs to make these battery electric buses work. So we're presently helping Transport Canberra, as Ellie said, to design the energy needs for the new Woden depot. And one of the important considerations uh, in this is energy resiliency. So in Australia, we've got um, uh, pretty extreme weather and we can have bushfires that can cause power interruptions. We've also got nationally a fairly antiquated coal-fired power grid. We don't have a lot of renewables yet. Um, and while the ACT government has 100% green energy, there's still the need to consider how you might charge the buses if the grid goes down for any substantial period of time. So battery storage uh, in the depot may help, but you may actually need to have, and you can see it on the bottom right there, potentially a, a permanent or mobile um, generators might need to be planned for. So we're working with the ACT clients to understand the level of risk they're willing to accept um, using historic power outage data. And that level of acceptable risk is gonna drive the cost of this resilience, the resilience infrastructure, which might include batteries, for example. Uh, and this can be a significant cost item. But in some of the depots in, in Canberra, they're served by two substations, uh, and potentially that um, it might be unlikely both will fail. But as I said, the resiliency is, can be a, a significant cost item. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, um, to give you an example of what uh, a transition pathway looks like, um, and uh, in this instance, um, this one is driven very much by uh, uh, integration of, of depot space provision and the lead times for other infrastructure, uh, the procurement of zero emission buses, the retirement of the diesel bus fleet, uh, and upgrades to the electricity distribution infrastructure and coordination with other transit projects. You can see uh, there that you might be able to read one box that says light rail stage two, uh, as well as achievement of stated targets. So the yellow line in this diagram represents bus depot capacity. Uh, the red line is zero emission bus numbers. The blue line is the diesel fleet numbers as they decline over time. And in this instance, you can see how the procurement is linked to depot capacity. So the achievement of additional depot capacity unlocks the ability to, in this city, to um, start to procure and, and operate um, electric buses. So an understanding of the lead times here, you can see towards the front end of this uh, diagram, uh, potentially not much happening because there are requirements to, to plan, design and deliver bus depots and the power group energy that, um, infrastructure that's required to to serve them. Now, Canberra's now going for a more accelerated strategy, but effectively, all of these considerations need to be taken into account uh, in determining the pathway. And so this concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening. Um, the next slide uh, provides some links for further reading if you're interested. Uh, and now I think uh, we'll turn to questions and I'll hand over to uh, Ellie. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Ellie and Brian, for a fantastic presentation. Uh, so before moving into the Q&A period, I would like to remind attendees to enter your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also you can download three PDFs from the presentation, as well as a flyer and a white paper on zero emission from the handout box on the dashboard. So we received quite a lot of questions uh, from people who registered. So thank you very much for logging this. And also uh, we have quite a few from the live session. Let me start with the first question. What has been the approach to manage large scale infrastructure changes uh, like energy charging uh, to ensure sustainability? Um, I'll make a start on this one. That's a very comprehensive question. Thank you for who sent it. When I think about sustainability in the zero emission bus world, there are a few points. Like the first one is to plan for long-term efficiency and making the point that nobody is going to transition overnight. The transition is going to be staged. And so sustainability is to make sure that you have what you need when you need it and also for the long term. So I think it's fair to be progressive in the technology and to not be afraid of the fact that the technology is going to be evolving because um, everything with, will be drawn by discussions you might have with OEMs or other jurisdictions as to how they do things. And as we said, like everyone is still an early adopter and there are mechanisms to ensure sustainability in the long run. Another point I, I think is about resiliency. Even if your solution in two years time is is probably not going to look like the solution in 20 years. The fact that you have this diversity of potentially supply, technology, type of charging, um, we probably participate in the resiliency of the overall system. And, um, and another point I think is around the whole of government approach to make the best use of the investment. Because we're talking about buses, but other vehicles will have to be zero emission to reach the net zero by 2050. So when the buses don't need charging, why not try and find a synergies and charge other buses or how do we combine space so this is a very broad question that could be answers answer i think with a like a three or four months project but if brian or Elia has something else they want to add i think that's good um i mean you could yeah charge other vehicles at the same spot but also to think about that whole of government perspective in procurement i guess so buying everything together planning the energy together you know taking the broad view not just for the bus transition at once mm, i think there's another consideration too um which was touched on around uh um, you know making sure that the people that you buy from um in the initial stages of your transition is still around to to support their product later on and uh, one of our colleagues uh uh, overseas says, um, you know, buy your buses from somebody who doesn't just make buses um, so that you hope their, their company is, is resilient in the long term, um, you know, then that you'll be able to continue to, to purchase and support your vehicles. Thank you. Uh, Lorraine, if you can just move to uh, next slide so uh, people will see um, uh, more information about uh, the contact details for, for the three of you. Uh, next question, what challenges does an accelerated transition scenario pose? Yeah, so this is a, this is a good question. So I think there's two areas where accelerating a transition um, potentially has risks. The, the first is in um, infrastructure lead time. So most bus depots um, don't have a lot of spare space and many of them end up not having much space to expand either. And so uh, the ability to, to convert a working depot um, or to convert a bus depot into a, a zero emission bus depot um, has some, some, some risks and uh, there are some pretty substantial infrastructure lead times if government is doing this um, to, to plan, design and deliver um, these, uh, these spaces. In addition, I think, uh, the other aspect is the procurement of the vehicles themselves. So um, we're a small country here in Australia, uh, a long way from anywhere, uh, and the, the ability of the OEMs to uh, deliver vehicles to our needs. Um, you know, we drive on the left-hand side of the road in Australia, um, and we have our own particular design rules. So delivering a compatible vehicle in Australia at the same time as there's this boom globally for battery electric buses would be a, a pretty substantial challenge, I think. Thank you. 
Uh, next question. What is the biggest challenge in upgrading a legacy system to zero emission bus? I think that, that that follows on from that first that previous question. I think that biggest challenge um, is maintaining services um, while you are transitioning. Um, and uh, in the ACT case, for example, it was clear that um, that they needed new depot space, and that was the the thing that was going to unlock their transition. Thank you. Thank you. Next question: Will there be any improvement on the if on the infrastructure of the city due to the emerging of zero emission bus? Yeah, this was something we didn't have a huge amount of time to talk about today, but really for zero emission buses, there's huge benefits to customers. So they're, you know, a lot quieter and a lot less smelly and polluting than diesel buses. So altogether more pleasant to ride on, but also more pleasant to be around. So there's big opportunities for uh, placemaking and urban realm imp improvements, place-based improvements around the bus upgrade. So at, you know, in changes, key locations, just making the city a nicer place to be. Um, so that's something to factor into the rollout as well. Good opportunity. And maybe as well, adding for the, the depot themselves, like an electric bus depot is most likely yeah. not going to be as dirty and as like annoying to be nearby so they can unlock some urban development as well uh, potentially like in the vicinity where people yep. initially thought that yeah you know you don't want to be anywhere near a bus depot definitely thank you uh, what is the future of hydrogen fuel in zero emission bus compared to electric bus if you can provide top five pros and cons <laughs> we might not get to five but um I mentioned at the beginning in Australia, the hydrogen industry and particularly for transport applications is not very mature at the moment. Um, so we do have a national hydrogen strategy and that's looking at developing the industry sort of at scale around 2030. So probably about 10 years away. Some of the advantages of hydrogen, so really it has a longer range than battery electric buses at the moment, although battery technology is improving. So there's less need for you know, you wouldn't need on-route charging, for example. Um, and it is more similar to a traditional fueling infrastructure system. So less of a change in the overall operations and quicker to fuel, um, but does definitely bring with it some challenges. So at this point, our understanding is the hydrogen is quite a lot less efficient than batteries per energy. So you actually need, need a lot more energy to power the buses. And at this point in time, the cost is quite high, both for that energy, but also for the buses. Um, as well and then there's a huge infrastructure um, sort of component so you need to obviously produce your hydrogen somewhere and then transport it to where it's going to be used so there's a lot of, of challenges and costs around that also um, so we didn't in our transition plan um, in the end we're assuming um, not a lot of hydrogen in the fleet mix for the initial stages um, but it is a dynamic situation the technology is developing costs are coming down so we remain quite flexible and our, our colleagues nearby in New Zealand are doing um, sort of trials and rollout of some hydrogen infrastructure so we're, we're keeping a close look on on what they're doing and learning from them as well as well as other countries internationally UK and so on yeah, I think also what's important is that at the moment, um, Australia is mostly coal power. And so you don't want your hydrogen to be from coal yeah. or from very dirty source. So until we have a, like a long a supply chain that's fully green, um, yeah. it doesn't really make sense to promote hydrogen just yet. Yeah, quite true. Thank you. Uh, what can planning students do to prepare for and secure a position in clean tech planning? Um, that's a, another very good question. I think what's important is to keep up to date with the evolution of the technology. And when I say technology, it's not just one, it's the, the field that's really evolving and multiple, multiple technologies are appearing and emerging. Um, and also originally, like I, I have experience in buses and public transport in general, but this field for, for students is an opportunity to, to have the come from the bigger picture so it include the energy considerations into it because it's really very much a transport project and an energy project so i would recommend to be interested in both and see how we can manage your major at uni to have a combination of both and um, and uh, another very important point i think is zero emission buses is one field but a bigger 
field is all the big data, like heavy data analytics that, are, that needs to be done um, as part of this to, yeah, just keep up to date, optimize systems and networks. So I would say data analytics and combining transport and energy are the key things I would focus on. Thank you. We'll take uh, the last question, all uh, additional questions that were asked and we were not able to, to follow up with the, the presenters who follow up directly with you. Uh, so the last question, is there any trend and policy to adopt autonomous vehicle on this uh, zero emission bus? Yeah, so um, I know our colleagues in the US are, are looking at uh, autonomous bus operation within the depot and, and this is an area where the charging method has quite a big influence. So for example, uh, uh, top-down pantograph charging um, use could be potentially more compatible with a, a kind of uh, autonomous internal bus depot operation. Uh, but yes, uh, most of our, many of our cities are looking at uh, you know full-size autonomous buses. We're not making a lot of progress, I don't think, uh, in Australia, but uh, it's certainly, um, uh, certainly a field that, um, that we're looking at, but uh, I think uh, autonomy is prob possibly some some way away um, in Australia, particularly. But uh, it, it's I say we don't have a policy, but it's certainly something we're uh, alert to. Thank you. So we're at the end of our webinar session. Uh, please feel free uh, to follow up directly with the team via the contact details shown on the screen. Uh, thank you very much for all uh, the questions that were uh, logged in and apologies if we didn't have time to uh, read them today. Uh, I would like to thank all attendees for joining today and thank you Ali, Brian and Lauren for a fantastic presentation. Great, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning and good evening. Bye. Have a wonderful day everyone, thank you.